This episode of the Senioria Podcast is sponsored by the Academy of Geriatric Physical Therapy. AGPT's mission is to further your ability to provide best practice physical therapy and to advocate for optimal aging. How do they do this? Well, one way is by connecting like-minded individuals around a specific topic. We call these special interest groups or SIGs. One SIG is a health promotion and wellness special interest group. I highly encourage y'all to check out some of the work they've done, especially with their presentation on physical activity, a key to successful aging. You can access this presentation for free and learn about how the AGPT can further your clinical practice at geriatricspt.org slash SRP. Hit me! This is a Senior Rehab Podcast, the podcast for rehab clinicians that want to better serve older adults. Hey there, Senior Rehab Podcast listeners. I'm Tali Spaceman. I'm Erin Carey. And today we have a very special guest. John Leland is an author and a journalist. He has been a New York Times journalist since 2000. Before that, he's been the editor-in-chief for Details Magazine and a senior editor at Newsweek. His recent book, Happiness is a Choice You Make, Lessons from a Year Among the Oldest Old, is a New York Times bestseller. The book supplies a refreshing look at what it means to grow old and a heartening guide for well-being. Uh, thank you very much for being here, John. Well, thanks so much for having me. This book started as a number of essays that you did for the New York Times. When did you realize and how did it evolve to actually be a book? Well, I, I started out, yes, as a year-long project following these six people age 85 and over. And when I was done with that year, there were some things that I hadn't quite put together. And also, I miss these people. They meant so much to me. I'd been following them, you know, every couple of weeks or every month for a year. And I'd gotten to know them pretty well. And so I kind of wanted an excuse to get back into their lives. But also there were some things I was working on. And I knew that, that I was kind of a different person coming out of the project that I was, was going in. And I needed to explore that. And the book was my way of exploring that. You know, it really shows in the book that you, you had a connection with those older adults and how, how different they are from each other. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I wanted to ask you is which one of those older adults did you start the most different from and didn't find a common ground with or found the least uh, in mutual with and slowly gotten closer with? I think the most difficult for me was a woman named Ping Wang, a Chinese woman, who didn't speak a lot of English. She spoke pretty good English, but we spoke mostly through an interpreter. Mm. So there was a natural sort of disconnect there, and it was a little bit hard to get close to her. And... When she was, uh, you know, insecure about her English, sometimes she would laugh a lot. You know, but something people do, they'll put you off. And I think it was a, it would be a little bit of a conversation stopper. So it was hard for us to have those kind of intimate moments that I had with some of the others. But as we got along, we got to know each other a little better. It really came out more. And Ping was such a philosopher about everything. And she was always giving advice and telling me her philosophies that... You know, that became a close relationship as well. And which one did you click with straight from the beginning? And like, we are going to be best friends, or at least very good friends. Well, the oldest of them, and I think the closest, was a, a man named Jonas Mekas, who is an avant-garde filmmaker, and he's turned 95 on Christmas Eve this year. And he, I knew going in, I'd read... You know, he'd done a lot of interviews going in. He was kind of my one ringer going in. I knew he was a guy that, that had an interest in the New York that I was interested in. You know, what was the New York art world like when he came as a refugee out of Lithuania and Germany in the 1950s? And he entered the art world and started working with John Lennon and Yoko Ono and Andy Warhol and people like that. So I had common ground with him right away. How much time per week did you spend with, with your subjects? And did you think you would spend that much or less time with them? Sometimes none. Sometimes there were weeks go by that I wouldn't see any of them. Sometimes there'd, there'd be more time with them. I tried to get everybody at least once a month, sometimes twice a month, sometimes a little bit more than that. But there was always a lot of transcribing and there was a lot of the, the articles took a long time to write because they were complicated, putting six lives together in a, in a, in a single package. In the first introduction with John, you said that it wasn't an encounter with John unless he said he wants to die. How do you carry on a conversation from that statement? 
Well, the thing about John is he loved to talk. He, he told me he'd always gotten in trouble as a kid for talking too much. He just loved to talk. So talking always got him in a good mood, even talking about wanting to die. It was the funniest thing. And you'd be like, you know, John, you know, do you really wish you were dead? And John would say, well, no, we're having this conversation. So he didn't, you know, and I'm going to leave now. Do you want to die after I leave? And say, well, Anne is coming on Tuesday. Anne was his partner's niece, who was his main caregiver. And then his volunteers were Scott and Marcus and Alex. And then there was the Met broadcast, a Metropolitan Opera broadcast on Saturday. And he didn't want to miss that. So he did want to die, but he didn't want to die right that moment. And so he didn't like, it wasn't so much that, that it, he was dismissing the life that he had. He actually enjoyed the life that he had. And maybe he enjoyed it more than most people because he accepted that if he was talking to you, it might be the last time he ever talked to you. So like he was never looking at his phone or checking his Facebook likes when he was talking to you. He was plugged into you. And I, I wonder if this generation is going to be the last people that are really plugged in in that way, you know, and aren't thinking about something else, thinking about what's on TV or what's on their phones. That when they talk to you, they actually talk to you or, and being in that moment. Yeah. <laughs> that are used to doing one thing at a time. Yeah. Aren't used to doing six things at a time. Thank you for that. <laughs> for me, there were two older adults that I connected the most with. with. Mm -hmm. It was actually Jonas and John. And with, with John, just because he was very earnest about, about his feelings and didn't try to hide the fact that he doesn't want to want to live or that he feel that that he misses his partner do you feel that as we grow old there are less masks i think so that's what i love about reporting stuff with older people because they don't there's not time to beat around the bush there's, i mean i think that people are still deluded about their lives and who they are and they still have illusions about how perfect their marriage was or what a great childhood they had. But I don't think people are trying to impress in quite the same way that they are when they're younger. Mm -hmm. This is something that you can help me as a clinician and maybe help prevent falls. In your understanding, why don't older adults that are prescribed an assistive device like a cane or a walker walk with them? There was a lot of resistance to, to walkers especially because it, it meant... Ruth Willig was one of the characters in this. She was really great about this. She said, and because she really couldn't walk without the walker, but she hated that image of herself in a group of women with the walkers. And she said it reminded her of the play, The Producers, where they're all in line, where they have the old women that are the, the financiers. That are, she, it was the movie, The Producers, for her, I think. But, the, you know, the financiers of the... Uh, Nathan Lane character in the movie. Yeah, the, the accountants. Yeah. yeah. Bialystok and Bloom. Is, yeah. So it's, it's uh, Bialystok is the, that character. And so she didn't like that image of herself. John Sorensen, same thing. He was, he was a little bit more aesthetic than her. He was a decorator. He just would not uh, be seen in a, in a walker. And he wouldn't have it around the apartment because it was just too unsightly for him. Yeah. But I think it... it Among the older people I spent a lot of time with, control and autonomy were a big thing. And they were always being asked to give up control of something. They were being asked to give up driving, or maybe they were asked to move into a faci facility where they couldn't choose what time they ate or who they ate with. So they were giving up things and, and have, to have to give up their mobility, to, the, the ability to walk on their own was a big deal for them. Now, I should say that my mother's entirely different. My mother's in a scooter, and she, we didn't want her to go in the scooter. We all thought, well, if mom's not in her scooter, she's not going to be getting any exercise. Her lungs won't get the workout. She'll be getting less oxygen to her brain, and everything's going to go downhill. But she was right. We were wrong. Being in the scooter meant she was more mobile, and she went out more, and she went to dinner more, and she could do things that she couldn't do without the scooter. If you can accept the stuff, it's a good thing. Is, do you think there is any way that we're, in, as clinicians, can accommodate that, that autonomy and still get our goals and, and prevent falls or, or any other goals that we, we would like? We, we never set the goals, 
I think that as a good clinician, you never set the goals for somebody else. Mm-hmm. Somebody else tells you what the goal is, or you form the goal together, and you help. Th- you just assist them to get there. Do you think there's a way that we can still make people use those devices, but still accommodate that autonomy? It's an interesting question. If people can see the walker as a tool, and, and the job is, is I'm, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to the store today. Then the walk, and the walker is his tool that makes that possible. If they think I'm going to go out walking with the walker, then that's something they don't want to do. So I, it's a perceptual thing. I think probably in the next decade or so, we're going to have status walkers. And then people will be like, I've got my status walker. Yeah. They decorate that walker, make it a little bit less ugly. You know, if people start off, in the absolutely ugliest walker, right? Yeah. They start in that thing and it's got tennis balls on it and it doesn't look like it's a real real device and like I'm not falling yeah. in love with that thing. Yeah, of course. We just we I agree that we need better design. Uh. We need to bedazzle the walkers. Bedazzle the walkers. Yeah, that's what we need. Yeah. Put put a Mercedes logo on the thing. Let's see where we go from there. Brilliant. Yeah. Do you think your experience from meeting the older adults and getting closer with them during the year help you figure out how to help your mother better? I think it did because it made me give up the idea that I'm helping her. Always my visits with my mother were about me doing things for her. And it wasn't that she was putting this on me, but it's what I thought about. You know, how can I help my mother? I mean, it would almost always involve turning her computer on and off. But they were, you know, you would move a box to a shelf or you would help her with some paperwork or do little things for her. Not that I do a lot for her, but it was always, you know, it had this effect that I'm trying to fix mom. And it puts <laughs> us in these roles where she's the thing that needs to be fixed and I'm the person that needs to fix it. And it's draining for me. I'm happy to do it. I love my mother. You know, you would do things for her, but it's it's tiring for you. You're usually ineffectual, so it's it's not rewarding in, in that way. And then for the person receiving this care, it's, it's building up a debt that they can never pay off. They can never repay you for, you put a box up for them, they can't do that for you. Though I always say about, I have friends that complain that they need to explain iPads and technology to their parents. And I always say, hey, they taught you how to use a spoon, you can teach them how to use a computer. Um, Yes, but I think there's a difference. If you teach someone to use a spoon, you know they're going to get better and better at it. And with an older person, a lot you know that their skills are going to decline in things. If it's visual, you know their vision is going to decline. If it's motor skills, their motor skills are going to decline. So when people compare that, when people say your roles are switched and now you're the parent and they're the kids, I don't, I don't, I don't think that's true at all. I I agree. It's not true. We do not reverse places. The the Places change. Right. That's definitely, but I don't think it's oh now now I'm the one that is the caregiver only and and it's this baby that I'm carrying around. No, right. It's, right. but people think that, and you know, in, in the book, one of the people, Helen Moses, who's in a nursing home, her daughter would always say, "Our roles have reversed," and I thought, like, no, your roles haven't reversed. Mm-hmm. Your mother's still your mother, but you're trying to, but you're just bossy. <laughs> <laughs> It's not an age thing, it's a personality thing. (laughs) There's something else that uh, Helen Moses' daughter said that that I love, and I always reprimand my students when when they don't do it, which she said, if anyone calls my mother sweetheart or cutie, and she used to get really upset about that. And I'm like, yes, because it's a little condescending. It's it's not a little condescending, it is condescending. And as as I said about uh, in one of the podcasts, she's not a sweet old lady. She f- fought the Nazis. <laughs> uh, <laughs> how do you think we can educate better the the population about ageism and things that are now they call it microaggressions? Uh-huh. Uh, but how do you think we can educate more about that? Well, it's funny. I think about ageism a lot because it's just out there. It's everywhere. It's not like. You know, it's not like that one person who talks about geezers and this and that. It's everybody. It's the least ageist person you know is, is ageist. You know, it's, it's just in the air we breathe. We can't help. We have this notion that being young is better than being old. Which is no better than having a notion that being white is better than being black or being male is better than being female or being straight is better than being gay. You know, all those are toxic 
value systems. But ageism, it's hard to talk somebody out of it. It, it, it is. And have you noticed ageism? I'm doing the podcast, and ever since I've been working with older adults, I notice ageism more. Mm-hmm. Have you, since you wrote a book and had the New York Times column, notice about you that you notice ageism more than you used to? I think I notice it more. And I did a, well before I did this, I did a front page story on that kind of elder speak, that honey and calling older people honey and sweetie and talk to people. And we did that uh, call out on, on this blog at the New York Times called the Old Age Blog. We don't have it anymore, but it used to be a popular blog. And we just asked the readers of that blog, where have you had people call you sweetie and, and, or honey? And like, what do you think about this? What annoys you about it? Or does it annoy you? Mm-hmm. And some people said, you know, they didn't mind that. It was affectionate. Yeah. And some people said, if you want to call me sweetie, you better be having sex with me. <laughs> <laughs> or at least buy me dinner. Yes. <laughs> in the epilog of your book, you mentioned that several of the six people spend time in rehabilitation. Mm-hmm. Did you get a chance to talk with them about their experience there and what stood out to you when speaking with them about rehabilitation? I didn't talk much about rehab. I spent a fair bit of time. Well, I spent a fair bit of time with Fred in rehab and John was in subacute care, but it was really the end of his life. So mm-hmm. the idea that he was going to get out of that was, I think, I don't think anyone believed it. Did he believe it? No, because he knew he wasn't going to go home and he didn't want to go anywhere else. So he basically stopped eating once he was there. I think he, even he might have stopped eating in the hospital before going there. But, but Fred was committed to getting home. And I did not believe Fred would get home. Fred lived in a, a third-floor walk-up apartment. And he had diabetes, and so he had poor circulation, and so he developed an infection in his foot that turned into gangrene, and he lost parts of his big toe and the next toe. Kind of tough to walk with that. You're 87 years old, 89 years old by then. And he was, he was committed that he was going to get back home, and he was going to get back to, to church and see the church ladies, and he was going to get, you know, everything was going to go right for him. And he, he did it. I never thought Fred could get back into that apartment. I thought he would leave rehab. I didn't think he was going to go into skilled nursing because he didn't need that. But I thought he would need to be in a place that was either had an elevator or was on the first floor. Mm-hmm. And he, you know, I think, I think about this with my mother. My mother has chronic pain. She's always had chronic pain. So she sees the world is getting worse no matter what. Because if you have chronic pain, your chronic pain is going to get worse. And Fred, I think, grew up poor and black in the South. And he's seen, saw this world get better over time. So Fred really believed that you do physical therapy, you'll get better. And my mother believed that you do physical therapy, and you're still going to go downhill. So self-fulfilling prophecies, right? One really goes after the physical therapy, walks those stairs, those little like fake stairs that they have in yeah. rehab, and does it, and he says, I don't want to walk the way they tell me to with two hands on the, on the railing, so I'm going to walk my own way except when the PT is there. I you, like Fred. You know, uh, yeah. You're describing like all of my patients yeah. right now. <laughs> so they're really committed to getting back home and getting back to their abilities. And my mother never quite believed in that. And so that's the different aspect. My mother is just out of rehab herself, doing rehab for a broken hip. Was this rehab different than, I know that she also had a spinal surgery, and was that experience different than the one uh, with the back surgery? She's had two, she had two spinal fusion surgeries before this broken hip surgery. So she's done rehab three times in three different places and hated them all. <laughs> the first two were two of the top named ones, and the third one we just picked the place that was closest to my apartment so we could see her the most. Uh, but... Uh, one of them, she developed a pulmonary embolism, and the nurses thought she was just complaining too much. And so I, we're a little unclear about this. I, she was either going to call 911 or she, had to, or she called 911 from the rehab and got to the hospital to treat the pulmonary embolism. You know, rehab, we, we know what's going on with Medicare reimbursements these days. Every nursing home that I've been to is pretty well understaffed. The Hebrew home where, where Helen is is pretty good because they do a lot of private fundraising. Yeah. You know, rehab is, you're better off home if you can get home in any way. So we were committed that she wouldn't do rehab 
she would do rehab at home for the broken hip. Mm-hmm. And then it wasn't feasible. Oh. It's going to get a little darker. <laughs> But I'm going to bring it back to, to nicer and more hip. So I work in a psych unit right mm-hmm. now, in geriatric psychiatric. And I found it ironic, maybe it's not. But ironically, a lot of the people that come with depression, with very severe depression, do not come with a DNR. DNR is a do not yeah. resuscitate order. And did any of the people in your book have a, have a DNR or have a note of decisions of what to do in a case that I cannot take decisions for myself? I didn't talk to them about that. Terry Gross, by the way, asked me whether I had a DNR. Oh, wow. Um, I think it's a little personal. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I thought, did you ask all your guests this? Um, Could you imagine? Like, um, <laughs> prereqs for fresh air. Like, <laughs> also, do you believe in God? <laughs> What did you go for? <laughs> oh, but we were on the DNR. Yeah. yeah. I didn't. I know that John was very clear with, with his caregiver, uh, Anne. Ruth was pretty clear with her daughters about what her wishes were. Ping, I think the same thing, although, you know, it's such a tricky thing because the goal, for all of them, the goalposts kept moving. You know, you would say, at the beginning of the year, I spent really three years with them because I start, I've, I've known them since the beginning of 2015. So now it's three and a half years for the ones that are still alive. And what they considered... You know too limited or really old kept moving it was always like one step worse than what they what they were or one step less mobile well I can still see a little bit so that's not so bad but if I were ever completely blind that would be bad mm-hmm. and so you know I hear about these dementia advanced care directives mm-hmm. where people make decisions about at what point in in the course of their dementia their life is no longer worth living and And then you read about the surveys of people with dementia and ask them about their quality of life. And it tends not to be so bad. You know, their, their estimation of their own quality of life tends to be higher than, than the where caregivers. their kids, kids put it. Yeah. So, you know, dementia can really ruin the life of a caregiver. We know that. You see that again and again. It can make the life of a caregiver a little easier, too, because sometimes some people get... A little more pleasant when they've forgotten some of their grievances <laughs> but you know that I think that sometimes happens the relationships get a little bit easier but more often I think they get more difficult and and it really drives the caregiver crazy but whether that means that the person with the dementia is miserable you know it's hard to say I mean you need to ask you need to ask the, the people yeah yeah So you wrote this book and, and started this assignment where you're in your mid-50s, right? Yes. What different lessons do you think you would have learned if you wrote this assignment in your 20s or 30s? Oh, that's interesting. Because part of being in my 50s was having a mother in her 80s, late 80s. So I'm, I'm in both of those worlds all the time. And if I were in my 20s, I would have a mother in her 50s. That would be a different. And my grandparents all died when I was very young. So I didn't have access to older people growing up other than my former wife's grandfather, who was a hoot. <laughs> But yeah, I don't know that I'd have... Well, I, I should say I've, I've met a, a couple of young artists who are in their 20s now, and they just made a movie using the cast of a senior center. And when we talk... What we're learning, what I'm learning in my stories and what they learn from this experience are pretty much the same things. They figured it out in their 20s. I don't know that I could have done that, but I know you can do it at that age. You know, it, it, it's one of those things, and you guys know this as clinicians. We do, we, at the time we spend with older people is beneficial for the older people, but it's also beneficial for us. It is. And people that don't spend that time, don't have that experience... Don't know that. Oh, don't you get so depressed working with older people all the time? No, it is like the most rewarding thing I've ever done. And, the, you know, when I talk to people throughout the healthcare world, people in palliative care seem to be like the most comfortable with their work of anybody, even though they get kind of screwed by the medical system. Yeah. Yeah. Uh- <laughs> No, but, but you're right. It is very re- rewarding. I'm not going to lie and say that every day is easy. 
Oh, no, no. I used to work in outpatient. When you get the 30 minutes and there's no problem in billing because they, they would pay for uh, rehabilitation after a knee surgery for a 24-year-old. Mm-hmm. And here you kind of need to fight the medical system a little bit more. But it is very rewarding. I have to say sometimes the reward are the stories. Last year I had a patient that um, he was very depressed as well. And, and he never wanted to walk but he loved to talk. So my incentive was, I'll let you tell me one story if we do a lap. Uh And after every lap, I got a story, and I got stories about him being in the army and about him being an undercover, almost like an FBI agent. And maybe invented, like he made up some of those Mm -hmm. stories or exaggerated, but but it was really rewarding that you find a common ground with, with people that are, not the same as you, right. age-wise. But, you know, you think about this. Everybody else in the healthcare industry that they dealt with asked them how they slept at night. You know, how are your bowels moving? Are you moving your bowels today? And, and, you know, they'll talk about that stuff. And you're breathing right, you have pain, blah, 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 blah. Yeah. And then you give them the chance to talk about being spies in the world. Are you like... like <laughs> About being more than the bodily functions. Yeah, right. <laughs> I mean, to be fair, I ask about bodily functions. Of course. Like, all the time. <laughs> yeah. Of course, but you also talk about because because that you need to put in the chart. That's true. I yeah, did not put not in the chart that. that he was an FBI agent. I would honestly put that in the subjective portion. Uh, but we, I mean, as PTs, we spend more time with. Right, you get more time. It's not a twelve-minute visit. Exactly. And, where you need to find out, you know, their sense of balance and what medications they're taking and this and that. Um, do you really think that Thelma and Louise could have had a better ending if they grew old and opened a mentoring program in downtown Denver? Well, <laughs> cause you wrote that in your yes, book. Yes. <laughs> I, well, I, what I think is, is that we love the idea that people ride off into the sunset and we just don't have to worry about them. That's how the movie ends. Like Thelma and Louise, they go on this incredible journey and then what happens at the end? They have to die. Like, what kind of world is that? <laughs> well, <laughs> Why can't they get old? Well, I'll you, tell you what, because that actually... You want the movie to end, but still. Because <laughs> uh, that actually threw me to... Well, you wrote about music before, so mm-hmm. you know Copacabana? Yeah. Uh, it threw me off to Lola in that song that grows old without Tony, and, and she's... You know, 30 years later and she's old and, and she lives in an era, in the disco era when, like, when she grew up, it was more of a, like a showgirl right. and stuff like that. And I thought there must be a middle ground. There doesn't have to be either, like, get into the 27 club and die young and, or go old with kind of regrets about what it could have been. And, I, don't, I forgot where I wanted to go, but yeah. <laughs> but there is a middle ground, and I think that that your book really helps with with recognizing that aging does not equal loss. Right, there can be a fulfilling loss. There is loss in aging, right? We lose. Yeah, our brains don't function as fast as they used to be. Our skin's not as elastic as it used to be. Our eyes don't work as well as they used to. That's loss. Our spouses die ahead of us, right? That's there is loss there, but there's. There's rewards as well. What advice do you have for us as healthcare providers to treat older adults better and to deal with their families better? Oh, uh, I think just thinking of people as not as problems and thinking of old age not as this problem that's come along. That you, that you know, Carl Pillemer, who's this ger- gerontologist that I like a lot at Cornell Weill and, and Cornell University, says you know. His life got so much more, more rewarding when he stopped thinking of old age as just a series of problems that he had to solve. And he thought of it as his resource as well. And he started thinking of the elders as the wisest Americans, the wisest people, because they lived the longest. Yeah. And I don't, I'm not here to give medical advice, but I think that for all of us in any field, whether you're a clinician or you're a real estate broker or, you know, lifeguard, to just look at this as a stage of life like any other, where you're making adjustments to the world with the body you have and the resources you have and the world's circumstances are coming at you in the way they are. And we don't really have control over any of those things, whatever age we are. 
Was there anything during this experience that you were embarrassed by when you were with the older adults? I think that's a, a, a luxury that journalists don't have. <laughs> or, or it's a luxury that journalists maybe do have. You don't get embarrassed about anything. I always tried, there was, uh, John Sorensen had digestive issues that I knew would embarrass him if I wrote about them. Mm. And I was, and they were, they were concerns of his, they were on his mind. But I wasn't going to write about them. Yeah. Because it would have humiliated him. Yeah, it's kind of like how uh, you said that you didn't ask, I think it was Helen, about her sex life, that she didn't get married with uh, with her, with Howie. So it's not that you got embarrassed that you didn't want to, to go somewhere that they didn't want to go. Oh, no, I did ask Helen about sex. <laughs> <laughs> I asked whether they had had sex, and she said no, and... Did she want to? And she said yes. And she was interested. And, she, you know, they kept on talking about getting married. She said she wouldn't have sex outside of marriage. <laughs> but she wanted me to know that she wasn't too old for anything. You have said in the past that this assignment was very much out of your ordinary, what you usually do as a journalist. Have you gone back to writing about culture and things that you've done before and kind of forgot about ageism and older adults and the population of older adults that is growing? Well, what I like to do as a journalist is try to pick people in a certain situation and try to look at what that situation looks like to them. And I wrote about, I spent a long period of time writing about foreclosures during the housing crisis. And so I wrote about what it looked like for people that were losing their houses, in danger of losing their houses, fighting with the bank over their mortgage, what that looked like to them, rather than writing about what the banks were doing. And uh, identity theft. I did a series on identity theft. It was the same way. I went to Iraq. I wrote about the fabric of life in Iraq, you know, what that looked like to Iraqis as, as the U.S. was preparing to pull out of Iraq. So that's kind of what I do. And it's what I did in the, in the newspaper series that my book is based on. But the book is, is, is a different kind of writing. And it's, the book is really about what I learned from them. And that's something that I don't do. And, and I put my, my, I'm in it, my mother's in it. And, and that was really different for me. My, my divorce is in it, and my, my new partner is, that's a paragraph in it. There's not much on those things. It's not really about you know, my life so much. But it is about what I learned from them, and it's, so it's more processed than the writing I do in the New York Times. But I'm back to doing that stuff in the New York Times. I'm start, trying to start a different series now that involves a very different population. Yeah. Great. Erin, is there anything you would like to ask? I was uh, curious. You say you've been thinking a lot about ageism lately. Mm -hmm. What specifically have you, like, what have you been mulling over? What are your thoughts? You know, it's, it's so big that you can't get your arms around it and say, well, our ageism is in here and this outside of that is, is not ageist. And it's, it's like it's a prejudice against your future self. So the reason to give it up is partly because it's the right thing to do. But, but for purely selfish reasons, you can give it up because, you know, we, we know from research that people in middle age who have a negative view of aging go on to live seven and a half years less than, than people with a positive view of aging. Probably because they, I mean, probably in part because they're in worse shape to, to begin with, and so being in bad shape means you have a bad view, negative view of aging. But partly because if you have a negative view of aging, you don't take care of yourself. You know, you know if you want to live, I want to live a robust life when I'm 90, so maybe I'll eat a little better or, or exercise a little more, or get some fresh air, or find hobbies that I like, or spend my time with people who are positive for me. Rather than think, well, what the hell, you know, my life's over at a certain point, what do I care? So, how do we give that up? And how do we, you know, we do ourselves a favor to give that up. How do we do it? That's what I've been thinking about. I don't have an answer to it, but I've been thinking a lot about that. That's an answer for me. So, maybe, yeah. you know, maybe it's, it's from my point of view, you know, I'm a communication person. So for me, it's just trying to make people aware of it, trying to say, you know, ageism out there. It's a corrosive force in the culture. And it's not like the perpetrators of it are hurting the victims of it. 
everybody's hurt by it. Yeah, that's something that we, with the podcast, we are striving to fight as well. Like, I think that ageism has, I don't know if it's a bad marketing problem, but it's like people just don't seem to be aware of it. We're just like screaming from the rooftops about how terrible it is. And it's really nice to hear that like other sectors of the of society are, are addressing it as well. It might be that there's like a different, it needs a different language. I just don't know. Because it's it's not really the same as sexism and racism because some people are never going to be on the receiving end of racism. Sure. You know, mm-hmm. and some people are never going to be on the receiving end of sexism. But we're all hopefully getting old enough to be on the receiving end of ageism. <laughs> so it's a different thing. I, yeah. I often think like youth supremacy would be the better word. Youth, I oh, like, I love like, this. Like white supremacy. Oh, man. Because that's really what it is, right? Yeah. It's, it's it's thinking that youth is the superior state. True. This is an amazing phrase. My last question, you had kind of touched upon it, but what are you working on right now? I want, don't want to talk about it too much. I'm interested in the positive death movement. Ooh, yeah, Ooh. like the yeah. right to die. Yeah. 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 But not also the right to die, but, but also some of the stuff that I talk about in the book about rec- you know, embracing our mortality, recognizing that it's, it's a part of life. It's not a failure. It's not like... Not like your body lets you down if you die or the the doctors failed you if you die. Like dying is what we're here to do. And living with that mortality, with the idea that we're mortals and we're as mortal on the day we're born as on the day we died, I think can be like a fuller way to live. Whereas being afraid of getting old and dying is no way to live at all. You talk about how the medical system encouraged people to give in to passive helplessness Mm -hmm. in the book. Has realizing that changed your experience with, with the, with the medical system? Well, in, in my mother's case, she's more passive than the doctors want her to be. So she's, she's very accepting, but you know, I, that idea comes from this wonderful woman, Laura Karstensen, who runs the Longevity Center at Stanford. And she broke her hip. She was in a terrible car accident when she was young, and she broke her hip. And she, she, she's in an orthopedics ward with a bunch of women who broke their hip, and they're all older. And she notices that she's 23, I think. She notices that the doctors talk to her about getting her better, getting her back on her feet, and talk to the older women about like, you're just going to have to live a different way now. You know, this is, this is the new reality for you. And she says, well, how much of, of what we call aging is just people living down to expectations? And so she's really, she's really wonderful on that topic. Yeah, I find myself referring a lot of, of patients instead of home to subacute or, rehabil- or rehabilitation care. And people sometimes look and say, oh, but they're 90. I'm like, so? <laughs> so it means that you need to refer people and treat them by their diagnosis and, and condition and not by their age. I think that's absolutely right. And I think there's this fascinating thing that that we all do. I think I do it, and maybe people in the field do it too. When an older person has a setback, our first thought is, okay, this is the beginning of the slope. Whereas we know that just like younger people, older people bounce back from setbacks. Not always, but it doesn't mean that this is now, you know, the beginning of the end. Yeah. You, you bounce back up, you recover, like his Fred got back to his apartment. Yeah. I, I love that, the fact that the setback is not necessarily the beginning of the end or, or a decline. Right. But, but I think our mindset goes there immediately, and then I think that's another self-fulfilling mm-hmm. prophecy. Because when you hear about someone that that fell in the bathtub, if they're over 70, you say, oh, oh my God, it's the beginning of the end. Right. And if they're below 40, you're like, oh, okay, so in, in like six months, she'll be fine. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Anything else you would like us to, you would like people to know about your experience? It made me not afraid of getting older. And that's learning to give up that fear of, of aging is such a wonderful thing. Uh, in the book Exit West, the, the novel, by, I think he's a Pakistani. Hanif, I'm blanking on his name. But he says that 
that despair, he gives the definition of despair, that it's not being able to imagine a plausible, desirable future for yourself. Plausible, desirable future. And I think, well, that's what a fear of old age is, right? You can't desire your future if you're afraid of it. So not being afraid of old age is, is, is like the opposite of despair. I like it. It means that, that growing old is not necessarily getting depressed also. <laughs> right. Someone told me early, early in my reporting, you know, a depressed old guy is a depressed young guy who got old. Yeah, it is. And you know where I realized that? You said that the fact that a lot of the things that John said resonated with me is the fact that he said every conversation that he would like to die And I say, I have patients that are young and, and say it in every conversation because they are depressed. It has nothing to do with their age. Right. Or I have a patient, and for me, it was the most rewarding thing to see her with the help of medications and good therapy a step out of the depression that she used to, in, every, in the end of every encounter, I said, okay, I'll be back here tomorrow. And she used to say, I really wish you wouldn't. And, and slowly... It became to, I look forward to it. So. That's John. And I, I was with the John on one of his last days. And he's starving himself to death. He's in a lot of pain. And a physical therapist comes by. And he's in subacute now. And the physical therapist says he's be back the next day. And John said, I look forward to it already. And it just, it breaks your heart. But like, I want to be that way. I want to live that way. Thank you very much for being here. Uh, we really appreciate it. I think that you gave a lot of things that, that we as a clinician need to think about, and, and sometimes we, we don't. So thank you very much. This is John Leland. He's the author of the book, Happiness is a Choice You Make, Lessons from a Year Among the Oldest Old. Thank you very much. Oh, thanks so much. This was great. Hit me. Thank you for listening to the Senior Rehab Podcast. If you only listen to these podcast episodes, you are missing out on 90% of the Senior Rehab Project. Hop on over to SeniorRehabProject.com where you can join the movement that's advancing care for older adults. You can join for free or become a part of the Game Changers where you can get some free gear and access to our monthly meetup. Just go to SeniorRehabProject.com. I appreciate y'all, and I'll talk with you soon. But in the meantime, do not forget to stay funky.